now that I say that. We are recording. Okay. This is, let's see, maybe. This is what our Facebook page looks like. Um, posts on relevant topics will be here, like the invasive species last week. Um, we unfortunately can't share our Zoom meeting links on social media because believe it or not, there are people out there who don't have better things to do and they join these Zoom meetings and just cause trouble. Um, I've only seen it happen once, but it was just crazy, the amount of profanity and just trouble that people were trying to create um, as a source of entertainment, I guess. So if at any point you wanna share the link that comes in your email with other like-minded friends and folks that you would like to join the chapter, feel free to email that link to people or have them reach out to me at um, wildonesofsipa at gmail.com and I will forward the link to them. We want to invite people, we just can't put it on social media. Um, Susan did a beautiful job last week with the Facebook posts related to the invasive plants. And she gave all of these great examples of native plants that you could replace invasive species with. If you didn't get to see those posts, this is a great resource. Um, now's the time to look around, see what's, what is starting to grow out of the snow. A lot of the invasive plants are very apparent now because our natives haven't quite started waking up yet. So this is a good resource that you can check out. Um, if you haven't seen it circulating on Facebook especially, this uh, PA law to prevent the sale of invasive plant species, this is a petition that you can sign. It's a couple quick clicks and you can share it. Um, Michelle's actually working on this um, and she's put a lot of time and effort and this is such a worthy cause. I highly recommend checking it out, signing the petition. We want to get all hands on deck to get the invasives to stop being sold. You shouldn't be able to go to your nursery and get something that's going to help devastate the ecosystem. Um, each meeting, I would love to shout out those new members who've joined our chapter. This is new this month. When people join the chapter, we like to send them an email saying, hey, we're really glad you joined us. Here's kind of what you can expect. And would you like us to shout you out? Because some people uh, may not be comfortable with that or they just, for whatever reason, don't want that attention. So we got permission from all these fine folks to say, hey, here you are. And the intention is that if you see somebody who joined and they're in your same town, you guys can tag team some open space area that you might want to tackle, a little project in your town, in your township, in your area, um, and, and get together to go to plant sales, to do fun stuff. It's like-minded people getting together. So um, that way, maybe we can just try and get as close as we can during these COVID times. It's so encouraging to see so many people from all over this area um, because that means it's more native plants in all of these little communities and it makes me so happy. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, sometimes when people respond, they put a little bit about themselves. Heather went through the very detailed certifying process for a pollinator garden through the Penn State Master Gardeners Association. I'm not sure what their group title is, but it is, if you haven't checked it out before, check out the application to get that certification it is beautifully detailed, a great place to start if you're new to the native plant world. Um, Alice tells me not only is she a master gardener, but a fundraising guru. So we are definitely going to talk with Alice about things that we can do to help the chapter in that way. Gemma's new to the East Coast, and we're so happy she picked us as one of the interest groups that she has going on. 
Rob is attracting wildlife to his postage stamp property. And Shannon sends me so many great ideas about activism and projects for this chapter. I really appreciate it. I love getting her emails and her enthusiasm. Um, Michelle down there in Wynwood helped to start the pollinator pathway of Lower Marion and Narber. Um, it's the first one in PA and it's spreading. And I looked into that project when she told me about it and it just is beautiful. I highly recommend everybody check it out. Um, just one snippet from the website says the simple steps to be on the pathway are to plant native plants for habitat and stormwater management. Sounds great. Remove non-native invasive species over time and replace with native plants. Yes. Avoid using pesticides and synthetic fertilizers. Perfect. And leave winter habitat for pollinators, meaning leaves and stems. So I think we should all check this out and see because it falls right in line with everything we're already doing if it's not something else that we can um, help with. Um, last week, everybody should have received an email. Anybody in the who's already joined the chapter as a member um, and they should have been gotten an email asking for your feedback. We're trying to figure out what our members are looking for. We want to provide a high quality service for you and we want to know what you'd like. More than half of the members had already filled it out for me, so I really appreciate that. It only takes a couple minutes. It's like four quick questions, but it'll help us get an idea of um, how to provide you the best chapter we can. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Each month we have a thought of the month. Um, and this month is about native plant agriculture. As the snow melts and we turn our attention to spring, we are excited to get back to our gardens and get our hands in the soil. Have you decided what you're going to plant? There are so many wonderful natives to choose from. Many of us plant natives so that our bird, bee, and bug friends have food and shelter. But have you considered planting a native food forest for people in your yard too? The trend is local and you can't get any more local than your yard. Most people know about blueberry bushes and raspberry canes, but what about persimmons and pawpaws and plums and elderberries, service berries and blackberries? We also have some pretty cool viburnums like nannyberry. PA is home to nut trees like walnut and hickory, and then there's the hazelnut shrub. We have ground nuts and ground cherries and grapes. And did you know that you can eat Virginia spiderwort and common milkweed? Teas can be made of passion flower, spice bush, and evening primrose. You can even try growing your own mushrooms. Lion's mane is one species native to PA. It's known for its medicinal qualities as well as its culinary uses. These are just some of our delicious native edibles. You'll not find many of these foods in supermarkets because they're difficult to ship, they bruise easily, and do not last long once they've been picked. If you do see them, they're often quite expensive for those reasons. And don't worry if you don't have large expanses of full sun. Many of these grow naturally in the understory. Of course, you'll get more fruit production in full sun, but it's not necessary. You can also plant so you have some fruit ripening throughout the growing season. For example, blueberries can be harvested in the summer, persimmons ripen in the fall, and some viburnum berries uh, persist into the winter. Just think what it would be like if every yard in your neighborhood had at least one native plant, one native food plant, the habitat you could create, the beauty, the bounty, the possibilities. What a great way to bring people and plants together. Please consider adding some native edibles to your spring planting. Who knows? You could just say goodbye to the grocery store and welcome spending more time in your garden. Thank you, Audrey, for that beautifully written piece. And here are some great pictures of persimmon and pawpaws and the lion's mane mushroom. And she also found a place where you could purchase the starts for that mushroom. And that's super exciting. I've never grown mushrooms. Um, another program that I wanted to draw your attention to because Michelle um, forwarded it on to me was the Keystones Tree Crops. It was a 2020 pilot program um, 
It's a cooperative introducing a model for generating right livelihood and economic equitability for those who work with bioregional tree crops. Tree crops present many opportunities. They not only feed people, they strengthen biodiversity and they sequester carbon. So this is another program to look into, if, especially if you have some acreage and you want to turn to more sustainable and regenerative agricultural practices. With that, I want to turn the program over to Sam. I am going to stop my video and I'm going to see about a new share. No, that's not what I want. I'm going to stop my share and then Sam, see if you can share yours. How's that looking? I love it. All right. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you all tonight. Um, as Jesse said, my name is Sam Nestory. I'm a horticulturist at Stoneley, a natural garden. We are the newest public garden in the Philadelphia area, uh, and we focus on native plants uh, in local eco regions. Um, so we do dip into uh, kind of the southern states, but we focus a lot on uh, native plants in our in our region. And today I'm going to talk to you all about some of my favorite native plant insect relationships. Um, and to provide a little bit of background about why I uh, can talk about insects and why I love to talk about insects. Uh, I got my uh, bachelor's of ecology from University of Delaware and I moved straight on to a master's in entomology and I got to work with the now famous Doug Tallamy. Um, he wasn't famous then, or at least I didn't know that he was famous. So it kept my head and his head kind of, uh, kind of in line there. Um, but he really was the inspiration for me as he has been for so many other people. Uh, and I just fell in love with insects during my master's. I didn't really have a lot of interest in them prior to that, but two years of, of working with them and here we are, I can't stop talking about them. Um, so I'm just gonna share some of my favorite native plant and insect interactions. This is totally casual from my end. So feel free to uh, interrupt. I'd love to hear your questions. And if you don't want to interrupt, there's, there's time at the end for questions. Um, so I'm going to start with um, herbivores. So I'm going to kind of break them into three large groups of, of plant interactions. So obviously herbivores are insects that eat plants. And one of the, one of my favorite insects to find in the garden is the red spotted purple. And if anyone has seen this butterfly, it's gorgeous. It's kind of small, um, but it's got this beautiful coloration. But not only is the adult butterfly beautiful, the caterpillar is bizarre. So the caterpillar is the one on the left. Um, and we actually found this in the garden last summer with a group of volunteers. I screamed very loudly. Uh, Jesse has been with me when I've gotten excited about things. Um, there's lots of squeals. And so we found this really, really cool caterpillar. And as you can see, it looks a lot like bird poop. And that is on purpose because when you mimic bird poop, predators tend not to want to eat you. Um, and it's a strategy used by quite a few species of caterpillars, um, but this is one of the ones that you can find a little bit more readily in our area. And the caterpillars are generalists, so they feed on lots of different things. Uh, this particular one was feeding on a black cherry. I'm sure we're all aware that black cherries are some of our most productive native plants that we can put into the landscape, not just because of the leaves that it provides for herbivores, but also those flowers are really attractive to small pollinators and even butterflies will visit them. Um, but they also feed on willows, oaks, poplars, hawthorns, birches, willows, shadbush, all these different types of plants. So if you're adding natives to your yard, chances are you'll be supporting the red spotted purple in some way. 
That also goes for our Eastern tiger swallowtails. So everyone is familiar with the butterfly of the Eastern tiger swallowtail, right? It is actually uh, one of our most common butterflies and that's likely because the composition of our local forests is changing without frequent disturbance and with the uh, invasion of invasive species, faster growing trees like tulip poplars or tulip trees uh, tend to be uh, making up most of the canopy. Uh, and that works out well for our Eastern tiger swallowtails because that is one of their food plants as a caterpillar. They're a little bit more specific, a little bit pickier than the red spotted purple caterpillars. Um, they eat tulip trees, like I mentioned, but they'll also feed on sweet bay magnolia, um, some birches, and some ashes as well. Uh, although we know that ashes aren't quite part of our local native plantscape as much anymore due to the emerald ash borer. Um, so it's a great way to uh, support generalists is planting natives, but when we're planting natives, we also really need to think about our specialists because they're the ones who are actually um, experiencing a lot of the detriment uh, in terms of urbanization, development, and forest fragmentation. And of course, we all know the poster child of specialist insect relationships, um, and that is the monarch. Uh, and when we talk about specialization and insect specialists, this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, and that's because it's just such an interesting story, uh, both now and just evolutionarily. Insect herbivores specifically can generally be grouped into these two categories, generalists and specialists. And when I say generalists, that means that they can feed on a wide variety of plants while specialists tend to feed on only one group of related plants. Sometimes it's a big group if they're related, but sometimes it's a very small group. Um, and like I said, the poster child is the monarch, butterfly, and caterpillar, and milkweed. Monarch caterpillars, as we know, have evolved over thousands and thousands and thousands of years to only eat milkweed, which is the result of a very drawn out and still continuing evolutionary arms race between the monarchs and the milkweed, in which the milkweed constantly develops defenses against the herbivore because it doesn't want to be eaten. And the monarch in turn evolves adaptations to cope with those specific defenses. And uh, if you've ever touched milkweed, broken a leaf, you know that their main defense is that latex, that milky latex and milky sap that is exuded. Um, and within that milky sap, um, are some poisons. Um, and generalists, in general, uh, can still feed on a lot of these plants, not milkweed in particular, but we we're talking about, um, we'll, we'll talk about some others where generalists can feed on these plants, but they can't eat as much, they can't feed for as long, and they don't get all of the nutrients that the specialists can. It's not as beneficial for them. Um, so that's where specialism really comes in handy in terms of getting as many nutrients as possible. But also in cases of these toxic plants, they actually sequester the toxins as well, therefore making them unpalatable to predators. Um, and all of this specialization that we see with, and I'll go through a few other examples too, leads is a form of, of niche partitioning, which it just means that different animals are finding very specific ways to utilize plants. That leads to new species in the long evolutionary timeline, and that leads to higher biodiversity. Um, and when we talk about supporting wildlife uh, in any way, biodiversity, in addition to native plants, is key to a successful ecosystem. So we all know about the monarch story, but one of the really cool other stories that we've got is the zebra swallowtail. So we were talking about pawpaws in terms of food forests, but planting pawpaws is also great for supporting this specialist insect. Depending on where you are in southeastern Pennsylvania, I know we've got some people from Lancaster uh, in Lancaster County, uh, there's a chance that you could see one of, in my opinion, the coolest butterflies in the eastern U.S., which is this, the zebra swallowtail. Uh, it's actually the smallest swallowtail in our region. 
Uh, we are in the northernmost part of its range and it's fairly rare up here. However, we all know that climate change is also an issue that we're all facing, right? So naturally, even without human uh, interference, plants are going to start moving north in order to seek those cooler climates or those climates that it's more uh, used to. So it's possible that the range of this zebra swallowtail could follow the movement of pawpaws north. Uh, but that depends on how prolific pawpaws are, whether or not we can support the species up here. So it's a great uh, incentive for us all to plant pawpaws. Also, pawpaws are deer resistant. There's not many things that you can say that about. Woohoo, deer resistant plants. Um, so there are actually very, very few species that feed on pawpaw because they do have some um, kind of toxins and chemicals in them that make them taste bad, which is why the deer don't eat them, hooray. Uh, but also when you're a specialist, that means less competition and higher fitness for yourself. Uh, but that means that the pawpaws need to be there in order for that to work. So plant pawpaws, not just for yourself, but also for these really, really cool uh, swallowtails and their, their caterpillars are really weird looking. I don't even know, they're not looking like bird poop, just looking really cool. So we just talked about the smallest swallowtail in our region. So let's jump to the other side of the spectrum and talk about the largest swallowtail. And this isn't just the largest swallowtail in our region. This is the largest swallowtail in North America. And it is aptly named the giant swallowtail. Here again, we've got a very adorable caterpillar mimicking bird poop. Uh, and I would argue that this one's doing a little bit of a better job. You can barely tell that that's a caterpillar, right? Sometimes this is called an orange dog. Uh, and the reason it's called that is because the caterpillars uh, of giant swallowtails feed exclusively on plants in the citrus family. So in the South, where people readily can grow oranges and lemons and limes, it's called the orange dog because sometimes they can feed a little bit heavily on people's ornamental orange trees. But up here, we're pretty limited in terms of their host plants, but that doesn't mean that they're not around. I have seen them. I've seen this butterfly at Chanticleer, if any of you are familiar with that. That's a public garden right up the road in Wayne. Um, so they are in southeastern Pennsylvania. They're just limited in terms of host plants. One option is um, regionally native. It is the hop tree, Telia trifoliata. This is in Rutaceae. Again, that's the citrus family. Such a beautiful plant. It's got this trifoliate leaf and these papery seed coverings. It's really, really beautiful. This is one that we have at the garden. They're pretty fast growing um, and just an interesting plant that you don't really see very often. And then we have our second option. And this is um, native to most of the counties in southeastern Pennsylvania. And this is common prickly ash or Xanthoxylum americanum. Uh, so if you're looking to support our giant swallowtails, you must plant one of these two plants. Um, unless you manage to somehow get an orange tree growing in your yard. But I know that's not why we're all here. Another really cool specialist species that we have is the pipe vine swallowtail. Um, and we have a couple of different Dutchman's pipe uh, plants that are native to this region. But this is another example of a caterpillar uptaking toxins from a really a toxic plant to most other things. And you can tell when you look at the caterpillar, usually if it's toxic, because it tends to be very brightly colored. So we know the monarchs are toxic because they're that bright black and yellow coloration. This pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar is a little bit more uh, subtle maybe, but it's still got those bright red dots that say, don't eat me. And what's interesting is when we look at the adult, we can see that it's got kind of a common uh, pattern for swallowtails. So if we think about our black swallowtails, which are the ones that eat carrots and golden alexanders, um, when we think about the dark form 
of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. So we all know the yellow one with the yellow and black stripes, but sometimes they're dark with purple, uh, this bluish purple tinge. And then we've also got our spice bush swallowtails. They've all got this very similar black with blue and a little bit of yellow or pale coloration to them. All of those butterflies are mimicking this pipe vine swallowtail butterfly because spice bush isn't toxic. Um, you know, sweet bay magnolia isn't toxic. They're all mimicking this butterfly because this one is toxic. So they're trying to say, hey, don't eat me. Even though I'm not toxic, I kind of look like this other thing that's toxic. So it's all a big crazy game in the world of butterflies. So specialist caterpillars are endlessly fascinating. I could talk about them forever, um, but they don't all turn into butterflies. Many turn into moths. Um, actually, most turn into moths. Uh, this is the rose hook tip moth on the right here, even though it looks like a branch or a dead leaf stuck to a twig. It has great camouflage. This is one I found on one of our arrowwood viburnums in the garden. And they eat only the leaves of viburnums. And they turn into this pretty moth. Not all moths are this beautiful. If you've looked at pictures of moths, most of them are brown, uh, not super flattering. This one is pretty. Um, and so if you plant any sort of viburnum, you could possibly attract this really, really cool caterpillar. Um, difficult to find. This one I just happened upon. I was looking for viburnum leaf beetle and I saw this guy. So check all your viburnums for viburnum leaf beetle, beetle and then maybe you'll be rewarded with one of these awesome caterpillars. So, okay, I could do like two hours just on cool caterpillars, but we're gonna move on because that's not all the insects there are, right? There are also specialist beetle herbivores. Um, all of these beetles feed on a small group of plants as larvae and as adults. So we've got our sumac leaf beetle down in the bottom left. They eat, you guessed it, sumacs of all kinds. Um, we've also got our mottled tortoise beetle in the upper left. They feed on plants in the morning glory family. Um, so we have a lot of non-natives of those. We have a couple of weedy plants, but we also have native plants in the morning glory family. And then my favorite beetle in the entire world, which is the dogbane beetle. It is gorgeous. It looks like it's out of a storybook. Uh, and these feed on dogbane. Um, and dogbane may not be a plant that you want to incorporate into your garden. It can be a little bit aggressive, uh, but if you've got a great big meadow, um, or if there's a kind of disturbed naturalized area near you, dogbane uh, can fill in those areas. And I would highly suggest you go searching for these dogbane beetles in the middle of summer. They're so, so, so cool. And when we talk about the sumac leaf beetle and the model tortoise beetle, they have a really, really cool mechanism when they are larvae. It's a little bit gross, which is why I didn't include photos of it here, but they will take their cast skins and fecal material and they'll attach it to spines on their back as larvae and they can move it and shake it. And it is deterring to predators, which is so weird and so cool. It kind of forms a shield. Uh, and the larvae of dogbane beetles don't do that. They're obligate root feeders. So they're feeding underground and they don't necessarily need to shake a shield made of, of feces to uh, deter any predators, but their eggs, which are laid above ground, are actually covered in frass, which is the name for insect poop. And that is strictly for a camouflage um, effect. So this group of beetles, which are all in the Chrysomelidae or the leaf beetles, interesting, interesting mechanisms for uh, deterring predators or, or camouflage. But not everything eats leaves like the caterpillars or the beetles do. They're not taking big chunks out of things. Uh, some insects feed between plant layers. So on the left here, we have a black cherry bark miner, and it is actually a very tiny um, larvae of a, of a micro moth. So it is a caterpillar doing this. 
um, but it's very, very, very small. And it turns into a moth that is smaller than your pinky fingernail. On the bottom right, we have a columbine leaf miner. And this is a fly larva. Uh, this is probably one that you'll see if you have, if you're growing any red columbine. Um, it can be kind of an aesthetic issue, but it really doesn't kill the plant. It's kind of interesting to see. So they mine between the layers of the leaf and they leave these really interesting marks all over. You can see everywhere they've been feeding. And then if you turn the leaf over, you can usually find the hole where the adult fly has emerged. And it's a similar story if we look above that photo. That is the holly leaf miner, um, also a fly larva, and a uh, similar kind of mechanism feeding between the layers of holly leaves, specifically American holly. Um, so we know that English holly has been planted for many, many years around here. There's actually a totally different leaf miner that only feeds on English holly. So very interesting specialization that we're talking about there. So if you see these in your garden, nothing really that you need to do unless it gets really, really bad. But I mean, that's the whole point, right? Is we're supporting native insects. Um, and what's interesting is that each of these leaf miners also has a very specific parasitic wasp. So that's why these usually don't get out of control is because most of them will be taken care of by um, a parasitic wasp that only parasitizes the eggs or the larvae of the specific leaf miner. And it goes on and on and on and on. The insect world is wild. So some uh, herbivores use plants in a very different kind of way or feed on them in a very different kind of way. So some use a plant's own defenses for their own purposes. For example, forcing the creation of these little homes for their larvae or their young. Uh, and all of these are types of galls. So when an insect lays eggs on a part of a plant, uh, depending on what kind of insect they are, they'll lay their eggs in a different part of the plant. Um, so we've got the goldenrod gall fly over here. The gall fly lays its eggs in the stem of the plant. It causes these chemicals and hormone interactions between the host plant and the larva. So the plant tries to grow around the larva so that it, continue, it can continue to grow. And in doing so, it creates a perfect little sanctuary for the larvae. So the eggs hatch, they start feeding on all of that bulbous tissue in the gall. The gall hardens when uh, we, we move from summer into fall, fall into winter, then it becomes their home as they overwinter and they will emerge uh, in, in the spring. And this is a great reason why you should keep your stems standing for as long as possible. Um, because also woodpeckers will come in and they'll make a nice little tasty snack over winter filled with protein um, uh, of these larvae. We've also got oak apple gall wasps. So galls can be caused by all sorts of different insects. So like I said, on the left, we've got the goldenrod gall fly. Oak apple galls are caused by wasps in the cynipid family. Lots of different types of wasps, but a lot of them in this group cause this really interesting, um, they call it an oak apple. Uh, I think it, it reminds me of something else and I just can't remember. Um, but it's a really bulbous thing and they lay their eggs in the veins of new leaves. And that's what causes that oak apple gall. And then on the bottom, we've got a witch hazel gall aphid. And which is cool because it, it's on witch hazel. Um, but I also think that these little galls look like witches hats, but that's just me making connections. Um, so then you've got aphids growing in that little witch's gall or gall, I'll call it a witch's gall. Um, and then they again emerge from the bottom of the leaf and you can tell when they've emerged when there's a hole uh, in that gall. So galls usually just an aesthetic thing. They're only feeding within the confines of the gall. They're not moving outside of the gall. 
Um, so leaving galls, there's so many. And if I say galls one more time, it's not gonna sound like a word to me anymore. Um, but I really, really encourage you to check out all these different types of galls. There's a poison ivy gall. Um, really, really, really cool the way that these insects are utilizing these plants for food and for shelter, all in one. And if you've been out in the garden, I'm sure some of you have seen these uh, bubble, it looks like bubble wrap around these, uh, these plant stems. Uh, and these are caused by spittle bugs. And you can see why they're called spittle bugs because it looks like someone hocked a loogie on this plant. Um, and what this spittle is, is there is a nymph form of this plant hopper or this spittle bug that you can see in the bottom left. So um, some insects, as we know, move from egg to caterpillar or larva to pupa, chrysalis, cocoon to adult. Um, but a lot of insects just go from egg to nymph, which is like smaller version of the adult. There's no pupal phase. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then suddenly they're an adult, they're sexually reproductive, all that, all that jazz. So this is an example of the latter. So this spittle bug nymph, so they just kind of look like smaller, lighter colored of these guys, feed on the stem of a plant. These are generalists, so they'll feed on lots and lots of different types of plants, but they'll feed on a, on a specific plant. And as they're feeding, they're exuding a lot of sap because plant hoppers, when they're feeding, Juices of plants are not super nutritious, so they have to excrete a lot of the extra sugars. Um, and that's where we get the honeydew from um, spotted lantern flies causing the, the uh, black sooty mold. Uh, that's, that's the same kind of process that's happening. So they feed, they're sucking on the juices, they're excreting sap. And as they excrete sap, they have an organ uh, on their behind that also forces air into that sap and adds a waxy substance. So they're essentially like creating this bubble home around them that protects them from predators and it keeps them nice and moist because they don't have um, a lot of that protective exoskeleton that the adults do. They're still really small. They need that moisture. Um, and each mass houses one or a few nymphs, they work together, and that waxy substance that they excrete with it lets this mass last for multiple days. Uh, and then they'll move up to a different part of the plant once they've uh, kind of you know, used up all that part of the plant, they'll move, they'll create a new spittle home, they'll keep doing that until they're an adult, and then they'll move on and they'll create more nymphs that'll build these spittle homes. It is sometimes surprising though when you get a face full of this when you're, when you're weeding, not so fun, uh, but a really, really interesting and unique way to create this home and utilize a plant for your own purposes. All right, moving on to everybody's favorite group, the pollinators. I'm not gonna talk too much about the pollinators that we tend to know about, right? So everyone knows a bumblebee. Bumblebees are generalists. These are just a few of the native plants that they like to take advantage of. So we've got spiderwort up in the top here. We, we talked about spiderwort earlier. We've got uh, swamp milkweed. We've got thermopsis. We've got rhododendrons even. They'll take advantage of lots and lots of different flowers as long as they can access them. Uh, but they also do have an interesting specialization that helps them with certain types of flowers. And I don't have a picture of it here, um, but are native roses, for example. So Carolina rose tends to hold on to its pollen more than just a bump could, could uh, let it go. So the, these bumblebees are really great because they practice buzz pollination. So they'll stand on top of the anthers, they'll hold on and they'll buzz their wings really, really fast and they'll actively knock the pollen off. Um, so they're really effective pollinators. We should definitely be supporting these, but people tend to know a lot about bumblebees, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our other bees that we might not know a lot about. The first group uh, is the megachylids or the leaf cutter bees. These are so, so cute, I find. Um, they're a really interesting type of solitary bee. 
It includes leafcutter bees and mason bees. I'm, I'm specifically going to talk about leafcutter bees here. And while they're generalist pollinators, they use plants in multiple ways. So they use plants for pollen, uh, to feed themselves and their young, but also they use plants to create their nests. So if you ever see a plant, think roses, red buds, things like that, that has almost these perfect little circles or half moons cut out, that is a leaf cutter bee. And it uses those little half moons to line their cavity nests. So it lines those nests and it also separates the brood chambers in their nest, uh, which is just a really, really interesting thing for them to do. And I don't know why they do it and other insects don't do it. There's so many mysteries uh, in the world of insects and especially bees. Um, but if you see these, I would, I would encourage you all to keep an eye out for these little half circles uh, come, come springtime. And now my favorite group of bees, the minor bees. So this is a, a small group of, of minor bee nests that we had at the garden last spring. Um, this is a, a bee in the Andrinidae family. That is our mining bees and they are solitary. They nest in the ground and you can see this female popping her head out of this one. Here's an above shot of what those nests look like. They really require um, sparsely vegetated, generally exposed ground in order for them to make their nests and they tend to like it loose. Um, so if you see these in your yard, try and keep that area free of too much veg vegetation because then you'll be supporting these bees. But when we look into what the nests look like, they can look all sorts of different ways. So they've all got one entrance and then they break into these different patterns. This one on the right looks like an octopus or like a squid. Some of them branch, some are singular, but at the end of each branch, they lay an egg. And what I failed to mention is that many of our mining bees are pollen specialists. So that means that they can only raise their young on the pollen of a certain group of plants. So what they'll do is they'll get a ball of pollen of a certain species or a certain group of plants all together. They'll fly into their nest with it. They'll throw it into the bottom of one of these uh, chambers or one of these branches. They'll lay an egg on top. They'll close that chamber and then they'll move on and they'll keep filling each leg of this nest. And what usually happens is the males emerge first. They can actually plan it so that they lay the female eggs the farthest down into the nest and the males are laid uh, towards the entrance. So the males emerge first, they get all juiced up for mating season when they emerge in the spring and then they're ready to mate when the females emerge too. So really, really interesting stuff happening with our mining bees. And just to put them into perspective, so we've got 4,000 species of bees native to the US, over 750 bees native just to the Eastern US. There's a lot of specialization when we look into the Southwest with all those different Opuntia, all those different cacti, um, but we've still got a lot of different native bee species. But of those 750, 25% are pollen specialists. That means that their young can only survive on the pollen of certain species. So what does that mean? Like what, what species should I be planting for these pollen specialists, right? Can be a little overwhelming. Well, I'll give you some suggestions. So down here in the bottom right, we've got some specialist bees that only can survive on the pollen of um, goldenrods and asters. So when we talk about really great garden worthy goldenrods, not every goldenrod is garden worthy. If you have a small space, especially, right? Some can get a little out of control. I'm talking to you, Canada goldenrod. Um, but there are lots of goldenrods that work really well in a garden. So our sweet scented goldenrod, our wrinkle leaf goldenrod, our zigzag goldenrod, lots of these goldenrods work really well. And not only are goldenrods one of the best plants to plant for monarchs, 
Other butterflies, generalist pollinators, and caterpillars, they also support these really, really cool um, specialist bees. The one on the left is Andrina hersentita. It's, it's common, so we can, you could readily find that one in your garden. But we move all the way to the right and we've got Melisodes alata, and that's a rare occurrence in Pennsylvania. So we can help all sorts of bees, all sorts of these specialist bees by planting these plants in our garden. These bees also uh, can survive on the pollen of our asters or our symphiotrichums. And there's so many gorgeous asters. Oh my gosh, I could have a garden full of asters and I'd be happy, right? Um, so we've got our frost aster, Symphiotrichum pilosum. We've got blue wood aster, Symphiotrichum cordifolium. Uh, and of course, uh, Symphiotrichum oblongifolium. That's one of the best in the garden, that gorgeous purple color. It's always full of flowers. Um, so I highly suggest you add asters, not just at, to add a pop of fall color, but also to support these native bees. We also have bees that specialize on uh, our Helianthus and Rudbeckia. So those are our native sunflowers and native coneflowers. Um, Helianthus decapetalus is a great addition to the garden, as is Helianthus divaricatus. Both of these are shade tolerant. So if you've got some part shade in your garden, you want to add a little summer color, consider adding each of these. And then Helianthus giganteus, whew, put it in some sun, let it go. What a gorgeous display. Um, so we're supporting an entirely different set of bees with these plants. But these ones also can utilize the pollen of our Rudbeckias. These are garden favorites. We've got our black-eyed Susan, we've got our brown-eyed Susan. Cutleaf coneflower is a great addition to the garden, also somewhat shade tolerant. Um, uh, all of these, if you haven't grown them, uh, can get a little happy in the right place. So just right plant, right place, depending on how much maintenance you wanna put into your garden, um, but all really, really great uh, additions, especially when we're talking about supporting our native bees. Some more, I'll just go through a couple more really, really good additions to the garden here. Um, there is an entire group of bees that are supported almost exclusively by vaccinium. So vacciniums are our blueberries, um, our bearberries, our deerberries. Uh, any of these are really, really great additions. And they tend to have these really beautiful um, bell-shaped white flowers. And you can kind of see how a bee would specialize on that unique shape uh, of flower. Um, so all of these are really great additions to the garden and can also work towards your food forest, if that's something that you're interested in doing. And then some last suggestions. Ooh, willows, we need more of them everywhere, everywhere. I'm really pushing at the garden here. We need some more willows um, because not only do they support uh, a, a specific group of native bees, this is one of the uh, genera that comes up a lot when we talk about native bees, but willows also support a huge host of native caterpillars. They're one of the top four when you're looking at genera from Doug Tallamy, right? We've got our cherries, we've got our pines, we've got our willows, we've got our oaks. Those are the four that we really want to plant. Um, so we've got our pussy willow up in the left. We've got prairie willow uh, over here on the right. That's actually a photo that I took. That is that little bee that was coming out of that, um, out of that nest, visiting a, a prairie willow that was just a hop, skip, and a jump across the road. Uh, and then also silky willow. Uh, all of these are great additions to the garden. Again, right plant, right place. Um, some willows can have uh, root systems that can affect septic lines, things like that. So just be careful whenever you're planting really anything. You want to make sure that it's the right plant for the right place but we can support all of these cute little bees. And for anyone who wants to explore this further, I highly suggest you look at, if you just Google Jared Fowler or pollen specialist bees of Eastern United States, you'll find uh, a great website, a really good resource for everyone. Um, and it breaks down 
the pollen bee specialists of the Eastern United States, tells you which states they can be found in, the timeline, uh, the phenology of them, and what host plants you're looking at. So if you're looking already, you can see Helianth is popping up there, Symphiotrichum, Solidago, Symphiotrichum again, Solidago again. Um, so I highlighted some of the ones that can support a broad range of these pollen specialists. And then I'm just gonna talk about real quick, my little, my cute little favorite visitors to the garden. So hoverflies, they're generalist pollinators. You can find them on just about anything that has an accessible flower. Some are really, really small, like the ones that we see on the left and in the middle. Some are a little bit bigger, like the one on the right. But the important thing to know about hoverflies is not only are they pollinators as adults, but they are predators as larvae. So this is a larva that I found on that brown, that same brown eyed Susan, and they love aphids. So if you have plants that have aphids, really anything in the Rudbeckia, there's a, an aphid that specifically targets Rudbeckia. Um, I can guarantee if you do a little searching, you'll find one of these weird kind of translucent maggoty type things. It's got a cool little pattern on it. Don't think it's gross. It's doing you a favor. It's all part of the ecosystem feeding on those aphids. And then we've got my favorite group in the entire world are the beetles. Um, and beetles can be pollinators too. Beetles uh, as were the original pollinators. So trees evolved way before bees did. And so our oldest trees, when we think about uh, trees are our magnolias. Our magnolias are the oldest. So when we think about our magnolias and our tulip trees, originally they relied on beetles to pollinate. And some of our beetles still do a lot of pollinating. Um, we've got our soldier beetles, we've got our tumbling flower beetle, which I think is a very, very adorable name for a beetle. And we've also got our flower longhorn beetles in, that, in the bottom right there. Anything that has an open accessible flower, elderberries, dogwoods, uh, open cone flowers will support these generalist beetles. And last, I'm just gonna quickly talk about some recyclers and their plant interactions. So when we talk about recyclers, we're generally not talking about specificity or specialization when it comes to species. And instead, we're talking about specialization when it comes to stage of decay. Different insects can colonize a log uh, or a snag at different stages of decay. Um, although insects tend to prefer hardwood or softwood. So there will be the hardwood insects who will uh, infiltrate oaks, beaches, hickories, that sort of thing. And then the insects that prefer the softwoods like the firs and the spruces and the pines. So when we talk about some of the first colonizers of a freshly fallen log or a freshly dead tree, those are gonna be a lot of our termites. Um, and termites uh, tend to get a bad rap, but they are really, really important in our ecosystems, in our backyards, in our gardens, because they consume as much as 20% of the dead wood in forests. That is a huge chunk. For sure, when it comes to insects, they're doing the lion's share of the work. A lot of the work also happens from bacteria and microorganisms, but termites are definitely part of that. And the reason that they can be there so early and can do so much is not because they can, they can digest it better themselves, but it's because they have symbiotic gut flora that can digest it for them. So they have um, bacteria and protists that live in their gut and help them digest the really difficult parts of wood, um, which is the cellulose. Once that cellulose starts to break down a little bit, wood boring beetles come in and they are some of the, they're some of the first to colonize as well. And so not only do they physically bore into the wood, chewing the wood uh, and digesting it themselves, but since they're digging far into the wood, they actually bring with them other organisms, bacteria and fungal spores as they're diving into it. And then also they create tunnels for other things 
to move further into the wood and help with recycling. And so these are metallic wood boring beetles, our buprestids. Uh, they're super weird as larvae. They've got these big chunky heads that are kind of diamond shaped, like think of a copperhead, but a gross grub instead. Um, and they turn into these really, really gorgeous beetles. Unfortunately, the emerald ash borer is part of this group. Um, not all metallic wood boring beetles uh, target living wood. In fact, most do not. Most can only target dying or already dead wood, but there are some that attack living trees and emerald ash borer is one of them. Um, emerald ash borers are very, very small though. So when we look at um, this red-legged buprested, which is down in the right, um, closer to an inch long, and the same thing goes with this gray ash borer or this gray um, wood borer on the left. So they're a little bit bigger, so therefore their larvae will be bigger as well. Which way is the camera? <laughs> Um, also wood boring beetles. We've got our longhorn beetles. They're so cool. Their larvae are even more gross than, than the buprested larvae. Uh, so these are called round headed borers and you can see they are just chunky, chunky monkeys. Um, but that means that they can eat a lot of wood. They can create these tunnels in these dying wood. Uh, and then the adults just visit flowers. They eat pollen. Very, very cute. Um, and you can see why they're called longhorn beetles. Their antennae are massive, and that is uh, an identifying characteristic for them. And then a little later in the decay process, we've got our best beetles. And this is one of my favorite beetles, uh, not just because it's giant and really, really cool, about an inch and a half long, but in a really unusual move for beetles, they live in family groups and they actually help raise their young. So on the right here, this is called a best beetle nursery. So these little guys are in parts of the log. The adults move through other parts of the log. They'll start chewing wood and they bring it back to their larvae and they will feed them pre-chewed wood which sounds so gross, but that's what birds do too. And we think that's adorable, right? So I'm gonna, I'm going to make this adorable. I'm gonna hopefully make people think that this is a very adorable thing to do. They can also communicate with each other through a process called stridulation. So that just means moving parts of their body together. It's what crickets do. That's what stridulation is. Um, and they can do it with each other and they can communicate within the law to alert to danger um, and other things. So when we talk about how we can support, see, how we can support these insects, the recyclers, uh, one great way is if you have a dead tree, not removing the entire thing. So I understand definitely uh, if it's a safety hazard, completely understand. If you can leave a full tree standing farther back where it's not a safety hazard, that's awesome. But if you've got something that's a little closer to home, literally, uh, then what you can do is think about chopping it at 12 feet, 15 feet, something where it doesn't pose a danger anymore. And that can still provide a lot of wildlife habitat, not just for our insects, but also for woodpeckers, uh, uh, chipmunks, squirrels, raccoons, lots of other things can utilize these snags. And you get to watch this really, really cool process of the breakdown. And so I obviously don't need to tell this group that planting natives is really important for supporting wildlife. But what I do want to say is that uh, in addition to planting natives, uh, I think it's really important for us to observe, make observations of what our native plants are supporting. And so, and not just recognizing it, but trying to identify it trying to understand why is this using this plant? What am I doing that's helping this insect come to my yard? And so these are some of my very, very favorite books for identifying uh, insects. Uh, the one in the middle is very, very cool. If you ever see something that is really mystifying, you just don't know what it could be, that's the book for you. Um, and then if you can identify, oh, okay, it's a caterpillar. Um, then uh, David Wagner's book, Caterpillars of North America, is really great. Um, but my favorite general guide is the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America. 
lots of colorful photos, really, really great. Uh, in addition to all of the online resources that there are. So with that, thank you so much for listening to me ramble about insects. I just could do it forever. So hopefully I didn't take up too much of your time, um, but I would be happy to answer any questions that you have now. Sam, it was wonderful. Oh my gosh, I was smiling ear to ear. I love bugs too, so, so great. Um, I'm gonna check the chat and see if anybody had a question. Marilyn, it looks like you shared a file to the chat. What is that? Do you, it doesn't come up with a title or anything. I've, it was a, um, a, a grub, I don't know. It was fit really large. It was like two oh. to three inches and it was, I was digging in the spring, last spring, and it, it I unearthed it and it was moving around. And I, I think if you click on it, you can see what it is. Yep. But I, I, I did not ever identify it. There you go. Okay, so Marilyn. Yes. Is the grub of a longhorn beetle. Really? It looked yeah. huge though. And I mean, it was really enormous. Right. Really, really big. The longhorn beetles can get very, very large. So we actually have an invasive longhorn beetle too. Not necessarily in this area, um, but if you've heard of the Asian longhorn beetle. Up oh in yeah. Germany. Yes, I have. So they can get really, really big, but so can our natives. They can get pretty big too. So imagine a grub turning into a really, really big beetle. Um, it is it is not surprising that you saw a grub that big. And you said you saw it in the spring? Yes, I think the photo I took was in late April or early May. Okay, interesting. And it was in the soil? Yes. And, okay. and I, yes. So I am not sure how they pupate, but it's possible that it was potentially about to pupate uh, in the spring, but sometimes they also go through multi-year life cycles. So um, longhorn beetles can live as larvae for two or three years even. So potentially a tree fell and it got knocked out or something like that. Um, but it's interesting that you found it in the soil as opposed to- And in it's in an area that I'm, I never, I mean, it was behind a, a shed. So I don't, mm -hmm. I'm never back there. Mm, interesting. So, a lot of people tend to find them when they're chopping firewood. That's when people tend to come up against them the most. Um, all right, it looks like I've got a question from Audrey. Why are the antenna so large? Oh my gosh, I don't know. Um, just for fun, they're so fun and, and so crazy long. Um, so when we talk about insects, antennae are really, really important ways for them to triangulate and kind of understand their surroundings. So a lot of us have heard of this with moths. So moths have those really fuzzy antennae. And the reason that they're fuzzy and fluffy and almost like feathers is to maximize surface area. And on every surface of that antennae are sensors. And that's why uh, an adult male moth can find a female within seven miles. It can detect a female in seven miles of radius. And that's because of these crazy, uh, crazy antennae. And so when we talk about longhorn beetles, this is all speculation. I do not know for sure, but longhorn beetles have to find dead and dying trees, right? And dead and dying trees do emit different chemicals as they're dying. So possibly those antennae are being used to, to find those trees. Okay, we've got another question from Shannon and she is asking about bald-faced hornets or bald, yes, bald-faced hornets. Are these wasps beneficial? Um, they don't seem aggressive, but still warming up. She's still warming up to insects with stingers. I completely understand. Um, so bald-faced hornets are actually not a hornet. We don't have any true native hornets. Uh, the only hornet that we have here in the Eastern US is the European hornet. Um, so bald-faced hornets are actually 
uh, just a type of large yellow jacket, but they're black and white instead of yellow and black. And they are beneficial in the garden. They are predators. Um, they really like they really like caterpillars, but um, if, especially if you're gardening for food, like if you're growing lettuce or kale or cabbage and you have cabbage worms, they really love cabbage worms. So they're a great part of the ecosystem. Plus they create these gorgeous, beautiful nests that if you can find one in the winter, they make a good kind of decoration wherever you're, wherever you're sitting. They dry really nicely. Um, so they are very, very beneficial. However, they can get aggressive as we move into the fall because the entire nest, except for the queen, dies every year. So they are doing their best to feed their queen, um, to get her ready for the winter. And as protein becomes less available because caterpillars have moved on, other insects are moving on, they turn to sugars. And so the most readily available sugars tend to be where your toddler spilled her juice on the porch or where you accidentally left some lunch meat at your picnic or something like that. And that's why they tend to get aggressive in the fall. Um, but I highly suggest that you don't disturb them unless the nest is above or very close to a major walkway or a major doorway. If you're looking to deter them from an area like your shed, uh, if you access that a lot. I have heard, but do not have experience with, taking a paper bag, stuffing it with newspaper, and hanging it from your shed. And this is kind of a signal to them, oh wait, somebody's already built a nest here, I'm gonna build my nest somewhere else. I can't guarantee it will work, um, but it's worth a try, right? All it costs you is a paper bag and some newspaper. Um, but I'd love to hear if it works for you. Sam, Susan had asked, can you talk about the 17 year cicada and whether it will be a problem for our trees? Oh, that's a, such a good question. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have a lot of knowledge of cicadas. Um, from what I understand, the feeding is not quite so much the problem as the egg laying um, or the, well, no, that's not true. Um, so they can physically hurt the tree and they also suck the, the juices from the tree. Um, I, I know a lot of entomologists who love cicadas and I feel like if they did a lot of damage, they might not love cicadas, but Unfortunately, I can't speak too much about that, um, especially about the 17 year periodical cicada, but I know that there's a lot of articles coming out right now in anticipation of their mass emergence come, come summertime. Um, so I'm sorry I can't answer that more fully, um, but, but I suggest that you, you look at some of the articles that, that have come up. And there's also some, some really cool podcasts also. It's a big topic. Um. Um, and one other question, um, you talked about ground bees, but what about the ground bees that make those huge nests in the ground and attack you when you step on them by mistake? Are they native and are they beneficial? Great question. So uh, the type of insect that you're talking about there is actually not a bee, it is a wasp. Um, there's like a little bit of evolutionary discussion about whether bees are actually just hairy wasps or wasps are actually just hairless bees. So, <clears throat> but the ones that you're talking about are paper wasps and yellow jackets, and they are social. They create nests. A lot of our native bees do not with the exclusion of bumblebees, but they tend not to be quite as aggressive as yellow jackets and paper wasps. Both of them, again, are very beneficial. They are predators in the garden. Um, so they're good to have around. Unfortunately, it's difficult sometimes to realize that they have found their way into your garden, uh, unless it is the hard way, which is you accidentally stand uh, in or near their nest and they get a little angry. Um, so, <clears throat> I would suggest if you can 
let them be because they are doing a service in terms of, of predation and, and pest control in your garden. Um, but I do understand that it can be a little scary to have them. Last year, I accidentally stepped near one while I was watering um, a holly. Maybe they knew I was a friend because they swarmed all around. They did not sting me. I dropped the hose. I stepped away very carefully, came back for the hose multiple hours later, <laughs> many, many hours later, but I didn't get stung. So I think part of it is also just, just being aware and being careful and, and maybe not running away, but that takes practice. That's awesome, Sam. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any other questions for Sam? Um, I know I want to keep her on all night and answer all. I want to see all of her pictures and every single story about every bug ever. Um, so I don't mind if anybody wants to continue for sure. But Sam, thank you I very did, much. Oh, go ahead. I did, I did have a comment about the um, cicadas. There is a beneficial predator, the cicada killer wasp. Oh, yeah. It's very. It's very big, but it freaks people out because they um, emerge out of the ground and leave half inch holes. Mm -hmm. So of course the average homeowner wants to come out and you know pour you know all these chemicals in the ground and kill them. And they're big and scary, but they're not aggressive towards people. We had one caught in our greenhouse last year and I put my finger up to it like Snow White. It landed on my finger to take a rest. I looked at its amazing eyes, took it outside the greenhouse. We looked at each other for a while and then it flew away above the trees. And before these five, seven year, how many year interval emergences we have of these cicada killers, we need to be promoting, hey, be on the lookout for these beneficial wasps. So people get a little more familiar with them um, because they do do a service. And also, so people don't start poisoning them thinking they're the Asian giant hornets that are only out West right now. Yeah, that's a great point, Justin. Um we had a very large colony. So they are solitary, they nest in the ground, they don't form large nests, but if they find a happy spot, you'll tend to find lots of them together, creating those really big nests. So take that native bee nest that we saw, multiply it by like five, it's, it's a really large nest uh, in the ground. But like you said, they're, they're non-aggressive and we had them in a, a large part of the garden we put a sign up and hopefully people started to get the message. Um, but it's like you said, really important as we move into this, um, this big emergence year that we do talk about them. They do look very scary. They're, they're giant. They're like inch and a half long um, and they'll fly low on the ground doing kind of these circles. And if they have a cicada, Ooh, it's a noisy, it's a noisy situation, but really, really cool to watch. Um, yeah, so I suggest everyone look up what that, what that insect looks like. It's really, very cool. All right, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. Yeah. You can see, I was gonna share Sam's screen. Okay, so some of the other upcoming opportunities that are available this is from Wild Ones National. It's a Meet the Designers. Um, anybody who is a member should have received an email. This, the registration for this event ends, <clears throat> excuse me, ends tonight. Um, hopefully it didn't close already, but it, I know it ends today. So if you're interested, log on to uh, nativegardendesigns.wildones.org and sign up for this. It sounds like it's gonna be a really interesting program, meeting the designers and talking about how they went about designing the gardens that they've just recently published through Wild Ones that are free designs that you can implement all over your landscape, whether it's a total redo or you just wanna take pieces of the design. Um, so that is a good opportunity and I, I believe it's completely free. Um, all Wild Ones members probably also received this email from the Tennessee Valley chapter of Wild Ones. They are holding uh, their 10 year and 10th year annual native plant symposium. And it's going to be virtually, I did not click to see prices, but check them out. Um, they also sound like they're having an amazing event. If you would like to travel to Tennessee, um, March 27th, they're going to do a 
an outdoor native plant marketplace. So if you're in the area, you know, just stop by there. Um, but this is the type of event that I hope our chapter is capable of doing in the next five to 10 years, putting on a big symposium. This chapter, the Tennessee Valley chapter, um, looks like they were probably established in 2012-ish and they have over 200 members. So that's such a great goal for us and what a great example. So if you're available those days, check them out. Some outside of Wild Ones um, opportunities, the Ohio State University is doing this great um, free webinar series each day at 10 a.m. Um, from Monday, March 22nd to Friday, March 26th with these amazing speakers. You have to register individually for each of them, but it's it's a simple like one click um, kind of registration. I don't know who else is, I don't know, Sam, did you get um, Heather Holmes' WASP book? I have not yet. So I uh, pre-ordered it and I jumped up and down for glee when it came in the mail the other day. It is phenomenal, just beautiful. Um, and she's one of the speakers, so I highly recommend. I'm not sure if Doug's new book is out yet or if it's still on pre-order also, but he has a new book. So there's just a lot of really great free, we live in such a wonderful time with COVID and everything. Um, that all of these people have put together these free educational opportunities. I feel like a little piggy in heaven. Like I just get to go to all these little things and learn all this great stuff. Um, I've shared this opportunity for the last probably month now, but there are a few more of these free webinars available through the Missouri Prairie Foundation. You just go on and register for those. And um, it looks like they have some easy to grow, easy to grow spring edible native plants for your garden. Uh, and again, as the name implies, they are the Midwest, so they may have some different things than we do. But I do plan to try and check that out and see if it's anything I can add that would be native here also. Our upcoming meetings. <clears throat> this is our meeting calendar for our monthly meetings for the rest of the year. Um, we are working as a board to try and get some garden tours, some group tours, some field trips to various native plant hotspots um, set up. And those will be in addition to these meetings. So if you're available and if we're kind of in your neck of the woods because our chapter covers so such a large area, but it's so rich in activities and and gardens and things that we can do. Um, we hope that you'll stop by if you're available and we're within driving distance for you. As those opportunities become available, we'll be sending out emails and we'll let you know um, through Facebook and uh, once we hopefully get the website going. So stay tuned for more information because our plans will evolve with, um, obviously with the way businesses have to evolve with COVID restrictions, you know, keeping social distancing and masking and all of those things. And I think everybody's still trying to figure out how they're gonna do that once the weather warms up. So stay tuned. Um, hold on one second. Okay, um, this is very exciting. So this is our first announcement of our members only native plant bulk group purchase through Octorero. Um, a detailed email will be sent to every chapter member tomorrow, but check out the inventory at Octorero. And if there are things that you would like to purchase, um, email at wildwandsofsepa at gmail.com. And just understand that this is a wholesale native plant grower. They specialize in trees and shrubs. So there's no perennials. Uh, it's just trees and shrubs. And as a group, our entire order in every species has to be in multiples of five. 
That doesn't mean you individually have to take five tulip poplar trees. But if you want two, and as long as someone else wants one and someone else wants two, and we have a total of five, we can order those. But if somebody only wants three and nobody else in the whole group wants two more, we won't be able to order that species. And it's in multiples of five. So if we have seven, but nobody wants to order three more, we're gonna let the people know who want the seven that, hey, we don't have enough. What, do, what would you like to do? Drop one, you know, we'll try and make it work. Um, but it has to be in multiples of five. Payment will be due when you get a confirmation email saying, yep, we've met the requirement of multiples of five. They have what you want in stock. This will be the confirmation and then you'll send payment. And then pickup will be in five different locations. When you email your order, you'll select which location you'd like to pick up from. So it's very exciting because these wholesalers have such a high minimum cost purchase it's like $500 and I can't spend that by myself. I mean, I could, but um, I shouldn't. So <laughs> the fact that we have the uh, accessibility of this because of being a chapter um, is really exciting. And it means that we get all of these great plants in the landscape, um, nothing better than that. So last but not least, if you wanna take advantage of that, kind of a um, opportunity, you have to become a member of the chapter. So you get on wildones.org and you become a member of the chapter and select our chapter, the Southeastern PA chapter as your, uh, as your chapter when you're doing that, and then you're all set to go. I have a little blinky up here that says I have some more um, chat. So I want to make sure I address those. Oh, you're that was just me. <laughs> so, welcome. Thank you. No, thank you so much. People are saying thank you, Sam. And then, oh, I see this article that I want to make sure I can get to. And then, <clears throat> no nonsense article about the cicada. Okay. Now, how do I? I'm going to see if I can put this here so that I can um, share it when we do the highlight um we send out like a highlights email of the meeting so let me put that bear with me sorry guys right here. Hmm. if you're recording this when you go to um when you go to save it the chat does save in a little uh, file all by itself. So you should awesome. be able to Oh, that's good to know. Okay. So exit there. Maybe I can get there. Okay. I did figure it out, but I'm sure I'm being goofy here. Okay. So perfect. Um, does anybody else, that is the end of our meeting, but if anybody has any projects or anything they're excited about or opportunities that I just wasn't able to put in the presentation, feel free to let me know, send us an email, um, look out for that email about the sale starting tomorrow. It'll have all the details in it. So I hope you don't have to stress about, you know, if you have any questions, let us know. But um, it was really fun. Sam was wonderful. It's great to see everybody's faces and enjoy all this plant and bug talk. Everybody good? I just want to thank everyone for their time and for their wonderful questions and for all the wonderful work that you're all doing. Well, thank, you. thank you. And Sam, I want to get over to Stonely so bad. I've got to just figure out a time because I'm sure it's starting to shape up. Yep, we'd love to see you all there. Spring is on its way. I'm counting down. There's still a lot of snow on the ground. but <laughs> I'm looking forward. <laughs> yes, the sunshine is such a tease. Yes. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, if everybody is good um, and everybody is very welcome, thank you so much for coming and uh, look for some emails. I'll talk to everybody later. Bye. Bye. Thanks.